Thank you, Costa. Um, check, is this the thing I use to? Yeah, OK, great. Um, Uh, hi everyone, um, it's really lovely to be here um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about a citizen science project that we've been doing over in Western Australia, uh, the Turning Gardeners into Conservationists Citizen Science Project, which is supported by funding from the Australian government, Government's Inspiring Australia Science Engagement Program. Um, and it's a collaboration between Perth NRM, which is a natural resource management not-for-profit organisation, and the University of Western Australia. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the lands that we're on today on Gubby Gubby country and also the lands where this work took place, which is on Noongar country in the southwest corner of Western Australia, uh, and pay my respects to traditional owners past, present and emerging. Um, I'm going to zoom in in a moment on uh, Wajak Noongar country, which is where uh, I'm from in Perth, and you can see Perth here in this image. It's a beautiful city. If you've not been, uh, the beautiful Swan River is going through the heart of the city. You can see there's a lot of wonderful green spaces, bushlands, wetlands, parklands, all of that sort of thing throughout the city. Um, and then in between all of that, there's a lot of grey. But actually within that grey, there's also a lot of green, which is people's residential gardens. And if those gardens can be turned into really wonderful wildlife friendly uh, gardens, then they can provide a lot of opportunities for biodiversity conservation by connecting those remnant habitats, uh, providing resources for wildlife, and also providing opportunities for people to connect with nature. So our Turning Gardeners into Conservationists Citizen Science project focuses all around that, involving citizen scientists to create wildlife friendly gardens and monitor the wildlife that are visiting their gardens with an aim to gain some new knowledge about the value of residential gardens for our urban wildlife, uh, to build community capacity for contrib contributing to urban biodiversity conservation, and also to understand the human health and wellbeing impacts of wildlife friendly gardening. Uh, if you stick around for the next talk, my colleague Bronte is gonna be talking about those first two points, the more ecological side of the project. Um, and I'm focusing on that last point around the human health and wellbeing impacts. So what were our citizen scientists doing in the project? Uh, they were monitoring wildlife in their gardens, weekly monitoring surveys that have been going on since August of last year. They could choose from a range of wildlife monitoring surveys, including active garden searches or uh, surveys of habitat structures like uh, the bird bath or very simple um, reptile shelter that you can see there. A subset of citizen scientists also installed new wildlife friendly habitat structures. They could choose again from a range of structures that support different wildlife. And these were installed in March this year, so about midway through the monitoring. So we really wanted to understand not only the biodiversity benefits that you'll hear about in the next talk, but also the human impacts of these activities. So how does uh, wildlife friendly gardening and monitoring wildlife in the garden influence people's uh, health, well-being, and their connection to nature. We looked at this in two methods, one being a, a survey, an online survey that was uh, sent out to participants um, right before they started monitoring, roughly in the middle, and we're about to send the last one out because we're coming to the end of the monitoring. Um, and that included these three metrics which relate to uh, the health, well-being, and connection to nature. So the SF36, um, relates to uh, both physical health and mental health. The WEMWEBS or Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Survey is a measure of positive wellbeing um, metric. And the last one, NR6, is a nature relatedness score. So we're wanting to look at whether those scores were changing over time for a control group versus the group that were taking part in the monitoring. We also wanted to get some really nice qualitative data to complement this, and so we had some amazing opportunities to do in-person, in-garden interviews with our citizen scientists. Uh, Travelled around the southwest and interviewed 20 people in their gardens to find out more about their experiences of wildlife-friendly gardening and their motivations as well. Um, so I'm just going to share some preliminary results uh, with you today. Um, starting with the online survey, so we had the, the first and the second survey results um, and you can 
can see the light blue bar is the first survey, so the full monitoring. The dark blue bar is uh, midway through monitoring. And there's a control group that uh, hasn't done any wildlife monitoring in their garden, and then the monitoring group who has been doing it. And you can see with the nature relatedness scores um, that there's a sort of trend here that the control group uh, had a lower nature relatedness score than the uh, monitoring group, um, and both groups tended to increase from the first and second survey. We see a similar sort of trend going on with the mental wellbeing um, score. Uh, but when we took a close look at this data and looked not just at the average, but with the standard errors as well, there was actually not a significant change going on from the first to the second survey. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, going on to the SF36, there's actually eight measures in the SF36, and I'm just gonna show you two. Um, one being the general health measure, which you can see again, sort of a similar trend to the last two. Uh, and then this um, SF36 measure of emotional well-being, which looked a bit more promising because the control group didn't have any change um, from the first to second survey, but then in uh, the monitoring group, there was this increase that you can see there. Um, but again, when we look with the standard error bars, there's not a significant change going on there. Um, now, there could be a lot of reasons for this, um, but what I really want to say is that, you know, we're waiting for that final survey um, to be able to see what's going to happen next. This was only over about um, six months of monitoring, so maybe it wasn't a long enough time to be able to see a significant difference. Um, now that they've been monitoring for more than a year, we are excited to see what the next survey result will show and whether there's um, whether those trends continue. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll hopefully be able to share the results in early 2024. Um, and this is the part that I'm really excited about, which was getting to uh, go into people's gardens and have a chat with them. So we did semi-structured interviews uh, with plenty of the citizen scientists in their gardens to explore a little bit further about their experiences of wildlife-friendly gardening and monitoring. Um, and one of the reasons it was my favourite part is just because I got to have a really nice chat with people. I got to actually meet these citizen scientists who are contributing so much amazing data. Um, and, you know, we had a cup of tea, I got to meet their dogs, it was all really lovely. Um, and so the interviews themselves uh, had four main sections. So we started talking about um, their garden and as well as their local natural areas and what are their motivations for gardening and that sort of thing. We then talked about um, specifically around wildlife friendly gardening, what their perceptions are of that, as well as their motivations and experiences of it through the project. Uh, similarly for the wildlife monitoring, their motivations to monitor the wildlife and their experiences of it in the project. And then finished with their intended future actions, um, both within their garden, but also within their local natural areas. Um, and the way that we then analyse the data, again, preliminary results, I've got a lot of hours of interview to go through uh, to get the final results, but um, we wanted to really look at the impacts on people's wellbeing. And so we examined it with these eight dimensions of well-being. Um, there's the emotional and the physical well-being, but there's also intellectual, environmental, social, spiritual, financial, and vocational elements of well-being. So as we were going through the um, interview data, we were looking at any evidence of these different types of well-being um, that were emerging. So I'm just going to share a little bit of this data with you today. Um, looking at the impacts on people, particularly what was coming out was a lot of environmental and emotional uh, dimensions of well-being. Um, so, for example, uh, one person was talking about how they felt a sense of responsibility uh, to protect the wildlife around them to the best of their ability. So this is showing a sense of kind of environmental stewardship. Uh, there are also people saying on the emotional level how these experiences gave them a nice relaxed feeling um, that watching animals who are free and doing what they want and suddenly they're not worried about traffic and the problems of the world. And then some that are a bit of a mix of uh, feeling joyful and relief, makes you think you're in nature, makes you feel a bit wondrous, makes you feel like a connection. And then this last one where they said it takes away the anxieties of, of the world um, and they felt that if they could do something to make a difference, even if it's gardening and increasing the wildlife population of some butterflies or frogs, that was really meaningful to them. 
Um, so we're seeing how being able to take action in their garden is, is having that positive well-being impact. There were other well-being dimensions that came up as well, particularly around intellectual well-being, learning about uh, and recognising the different species that were visiting their gardens and also learning about the structures that they were putting in like their nest boxes, feeling excited about seeing whether any uh, wildlife would take them up um, and recognising what works and what doesn't. For others, it was more a social wellbeing, a way to connect with like-minded people. Um, there was this spiritual wellbeing of being far more present, particularly with the wildlife monitoring. A lot of people said how they would have a cup of tea and just spend their time sitting on the deck and feeling very meditative. So that was really wonderful. Um, physical well-being as well, the, the importance of spending the time outdoors, uh, doing something a bit physical rather than just sitting inside. And then this one which I really love, which was uh, they felt uh, every sense comes alive. From hearing the birds, smelling the blossom or whatever's out in flower, seeing, touching every sense. Um, so this is just a bit of a quick glimpse into all of the data that we've been collecting around the human health and well-being impacts of this citizen science project. Um, and I hope that it can show that there really is an important value of understanding those benefits for people. Um, that connection with nature for people is a really important part of the wildlife friendly gardening. Without people, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, and so just in summary, while the surveys had some interesting trends and no significant results yet, we're excited to see what the final survey results will reveal. Um, and then in the interviews, it was mainly environmental and emotional well-being dimensions that were coming up, but many other dimensions as well. Um, and we're really excited to explore this further. So I just want to end by saying thank you so much uh, for listening and thank you to the project team that you can see here, uh, Hannah Gulliver, myself, Paul Close and Bronte Van Helden, um, as well as the 223 citizen scientists that have been involved in the project, without whom this wouldn't be possible. Uh, you can find out more at the website or get in touch. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Laura. Gee, 223 people. That's that's a solid tap into the gardening world. Definitely. Yeah. Um, thanks for a great presentation. Any questions? We've got time for probably two questions before we roll on. Oh, okay. Thanks, ladies. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how you found those 220 people. <laughs> was it random? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, the recruitment of citizen scientists actually happened before I joined the project. So Bronte might be able to speak a little bit more on it. But um, there was a big uh, uh, push for um, sort of sharing the message about this project. There was an initial recruitment survey that I think about 2,000 people responded to with um, interest in the project. and in wildlife friendly gardening itself. Um, from that, it then trickled to about 600 people who registered to like be involved. And then we've had the 223 who've been actively involved throughout the project. So um, yeah, but some of the ways were, I think uh, there were radio interviews and it was uh, project partners that I've listed here. They shared it out through their, their networks as well. So yeah. And local businesses, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the, I mean, the councils are a great great way to, to get message out there to at that local level that's for sure oh we've got one more one more question over there um, will it be uh, profiled or shown on gardening Australia yeah <laughs> oh great question no, okay. I uh, I'm taking big notes <laughs> definitely I mean I think there's so many amazing citizen scientists that were involved in this project who are doing amazing things in their gardens that just the 20 that I went to all had amazing gardens. So if I can connect them with Gardening Australia as well, that would be awesome. Fantastic. All right, we'll take this as the last question and then. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Do, you, do you want to go? Sure. <laughs> amazing project. Um, I was just wondering, are there any plans for any sort of long-term evaluation, maybe like a year or so on where you can share the stories of these people? Yeah, great question. Um, I would love to do that, I'd like to be able to revisit the people that have been involved in the project, um, you know, a year from now, say, and see if they're still monitoring the wildlife in their gardens or what other actions they've been taking in their gardens, especially because we asked about their intended future actions. So to be able to follow up and say, well, did you, did you go ahead and do, um, you know, put in the pond that you said you wanted to put in? Um, 
Yeah, at this stage, I mean, our funding unfortunately goes till the end of March. So we're looking for, for more opportunities though to, to try and continue this project. So yeah, if anyone has ideas um, or wants to collaborate, then yeah, come and have a chat with us because we'd love to explore opportunities. Oh, I we'll give the benefit of the doubt because you know we can't we can't just do it. Thank you. I just have one question about how many of these um, participants were living in their single dwellings and how many were living in multi dwelling uh, residences where they couldn't control, for example, cats and other things and whether yeah, if that's a simple question mm -hmm. because from it arise issues about potential conflict of values and so on. Yeah, definitely. So um, as part of the, the project, we also got all of the participants to do a garden site assessment to share some details with us about the kind of household they were living in, as well as, you know, as some demographic information about them. Um, there was a there was a real mix. I would say probably majority, I think, uh, were living in sort of a, a household where they, they had their own access to a garden. Um, and so we would like to look at other opportunities to connect with uh, people who are in, say, like apartment buildings um, and that sort of thing, where they might have a shared garden space or just a balcony or things like that to be able to connect them with the wildlife in their outdoor space as well. Yeah, thank you. 